How many of you have been the opposite? You read something, you get to the end of the page, and then you forgot what you just read. And you go back and you reread it, and you still don't know what you just read, right? And that's a big problem, right? Because you're wasting your most valuable asset, which is your time. Hey. All right, who's ready for a, a really solid download right now? Yeah. I've had a, a lot of, uh, I've been writing a lot and coming up with uh, this, this idea of becoming limitless with your mind. How many people believe that we could go beyond what we believe that we could go beyond? And I think really the key to that, one of the most obvious ways of doing that is reading. And when I say reading, and not, not a lot of people go to a reading class, so I appreciate you for being here. Um, I really feel like it's one of the most valuable skills to master today. It's, it's something where you're, if somebody has decades of experience in anything, and they put it into a book, and you could read it in a day or two or three or four, you could download decades in a days, I think it's the ultimate advantage there is. And um, in, in Game of Thrones, there's, there's this quote saying that a reader lives a thousand lives. A person who does not read lives only one. You know what I mean? And so if you want that edge, if you want that advantage, and I'm not just talking about nonfiction reading, I'm talking about fiction reading too. Um, how many of you enjoy uh, pleasure reading, uh, reading stories? You know, it's been shown to help with your creativity. It's been shown to uh, be helpful for your imagination. It's been shown to be able to increase your EQ, your level of empathy and relatedness and leadership uh, from parenting to team building. And so this is a skill that it's not, it's a little bit, when we taught, we were taught in school, a little bit dry. And I could see why some people don't want to indulge in it all the time. And it becomes something like a nice to have. If I have a free time, then I'll pick up a book. But it's always kind of like last. And what I'm here to say is if you, when you put something like reading first, your life opens up in so many different ways. And I know that from personal experience because I, I had a lot of trouble reading when I was a child. You know, after my injury, it took me an extra three and a half years to learn how to read, and it created a lot of trauma in me. You remember when you were in school and they would uh, put you in circles when you first learned how to read, and they would pass around a book, and you'd have to read out loud? How many people remember that? I mean, people, that was terrifying. I mean, for me, I really do believe when you're talking about learning and where we learn uh, false beliefs, where we learn to be fearful for certain things, I feel like that was one of those points where we're extremely vulnerable. And I think if people have a fear of public speaking, I think 90% of it came from those reading circles. <laughs> and because here's the thing, emotion plays a difference. It makes a difference, right? The state you learn something in is the state it gets like encoded. Right? And one of the challenges with reading is a lot of people use reading as a sedative. Like how many of you, you have a book that's been sitting by your bedside an embarrassingly long time, but you pick it up to fall asleep. And that's not the right state to have while you, because you'll take that into when you need to prepare for meetings and prepare for your, your personal development. And that, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about state. In fact, Sit right now the way you'd be sitting if you're totally interested and engaged with what I was saying. You're ready to... Go now, why do you even have to move? <laughs> but you know, and I'm going to ask you to take a lot of notes here because I'm going to give you... I have 30 minutes with you, and I'm going to give you like a really big download. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is, for the first part of your notes, is write that. All learning is state-dependent. All learning is state-dependent. That if I want to learn something brand new, I never just pick up a book and start reading it. I never do that. I never just listen to a podcast. I put myself in a state where I'm going to be more receptive to it. Does that make sense? I'll show you how to do that. And I don't even have to show you how to do that. You know how to do that. I ask you to be totally interested and focused and engaged, and you just change your body automatically. So you know how to do that. You just need a coach to remind you, right? Even like uh, movement coaches showing you just, hey, reminding you to keep your posture or to be able to breathe. Because the problem is a lot of people don't like reading simply because they're collapsed all the time. Like do this, like, like slump down a little bit. Go back to where you were. <laughs> <laughs> now just look down and just not, notice how that feels, right? You don't feel very motivated, inspired, and focused. You're in your, 
And one of the reasons why, sit back up, you don't want to stay there, is that you collapse your what? Yeah, your diaphragm. And the lower one third of your lungs absorbs two thirds of the oxygen. And a lot of us, part of the state, the brain fog, how many of you are struggling with like mental energy? And you're concerned that this, this mind fog, if you will, is getting in the way. Part of it is you're just not getting oxygen to your brain. Your brain is only 2% of your body mass, but it requires 20% of the nutrients. So it's very, it all the organs in your body really are there to be able to serve your brain. Your heart, you know, beating, uh, bringing blood and oxygen to your brain, your liver cleaning things out uh, so not to be toxic to your brain. But you want to give yourselves the optimal condition. So when you're taking notes, what I'm going to ask you to do on a piece of paper, I'm going to ask you to do something new. So I'm going to ask you to put a line right down the page. Now, here's the thing. If you've heard me say some of these things before, I do it on purpose because repetition is very important to learning. Yes or yes? Yes. Make it really easy this morning. <laughs> it is because here's what keeps you from mastery. The fact that you're here says a lot about you. And I appreciate you being here because most people don't show up for things. So already, already there, you're, you're winning. How many people feel that? Because you've self-selected to be here. Now, how many of you came here at personal, maybe lack of a better word, sacrifice? It took a lot for you to be here, financially, time-wise, away from your family, focus, right? But you do what's hard, and then you get the benefit from it. But you only get the benefit of it if you use it. Does that make sense? And I know you know that, but part of what a coach does is he or she reminds you of what you do when you're great. It reminds you of what's inside. And I feel like the thing that keeps you from becoming a master or on that path of mastery are these words saying, oh, I know that already. Do you know what I mean? And I do it too sometimes. It's like, oh, I know that already, something else. But the masters really get good at the basics and the fundamentals because that, that's everything. And so that's really what's going to give you the most return. So when you're taking notes, put a line down the page. And on the left side, if you're familiar with this, some of you know this and you could quote me on this. But if you're not doing it, I feel like you don't know it. Is that fair? On the left side, you're going to take notes. Right? You're going to capture the ideas that I'm sharing with you. On the right side, you're not going to take notes. You're going to make notes. Now, it's a subtle difference, but I do this even when I'm reading. You know, when I'm reading nonfiction and I want to study something, I'll have a notepad where I'm taking notes also and then making notes. Now, so on the left side, I'm capturing. On the right side, I'm creating. Does that make sense? Meaning that, and what am I creating on the right side? I'm writing my impressions of what I'm capturing. Because if your mind gets distracted, which we naturally do, I'd rather it be distracted than on the right side of the page using my imagination for something that's going to move me forward and what I'm learning. Now, there are three magical questions you want to ask yourself and capture on the right side of the page. These are the three questions I obsess about. So when I want to learn something and I'm reading something and I want to get the most out of it, how many of you have been the opposite? You read something, you get to the end of the page, and then you forgot what you just read. <laughs> Look around. And you go back and you reread it, and you still don't know what you just read. Right? And that's a big problem, right? Because you're wasting your most valuable asset, which is your time. And the reason why all the speakers here give 100% is because we know your time is valuable. Like, I want to make the next, this session so valuable when you leave, you're like, I would have came and paid just for this one talk. You know what I mean? Because I know what it's like when I first learned these skills. I traveled around the world. I bought every audio program, audio cassette. No, I'm dating myself, but it's like... <laughs> But I bought all these programs because that's the thing that's going to help me be able to grow the most. And so on the right side, the three questions I obsess about to get the most out of my reading or listening to a podcast or anything else, I ask myself these three questions. I ask myself, how can I use this? Now, it's so basic, but I like to make the, the, the things that are going to give you the highest return, I want to make them as simple as possible so you do it. How can I use this? And this is your creativity. You're listening to me as I speak here and all the other speakers, and you're, you're asking, how can I use this? Because you have a dominant question you ask all the time, and it's been imprinted on you since you were a child, right? And so for me, growing up as the boy with a broken brain, I, I would be very introverted, very shy, and I would just, my superpower back then was being invisible, right? Because I didn't want to be seen or heard um, because I didn't feel like I was enough. 
and that's just more what my reality was. But my imagination would kick in all the time because I would watch people and observe them and ask, why is that person so smart? Why, why am I working, why do I have to work three times harder to do worse than this person, right? And I'm always, the question I would ask all the time was, how can I make this better? Because I was obsessed. And the key to reading comprehension is asking more questions. If you read a page in a book, get to the end and not get anything out of it, it's because you're not asking questions because questions are the answer. You write that on the left side. Questions are the answer because ask and you shall receive. And so that's all thinking is. When you really break down functionally what thought and thinking is, when you're in a corner thinking to yourself, you're asking questions and then you're answering them. And you probably are like, is that true? You notice you had to ask a question to be able to think about that, right? And so on the right side, I'm thinking about questions like, how can I use this? And this is like, oh, there's one way I could use it, another way, another way. The second question I obsess about, and I, I would capture it on the right side, to be able to, when you're taking notes throughout today and the rest of your life, the, on the right side I would say, why must I use this? Because here's the thing, the biggest lie in the personal development industry is that knowledge is power. It is. It's just you feel like you got points because you signed up for a seminar or a webinar, you bought a book and it sits on your shelf and it becomes shelf help instead of self help because it just, <laughs> it just sits there, right? But it doesn't become, uh, the truth is, what people don't tell you is all the podcasts, coaching, conferences, online programs, none of it works unless you work, right? Is that fair to say? Like you, you can't read a book on doing like push-ups and get benefit from that. It just doesn't work, right? So you have to do the work. So I'm asking myself, how can I use this? And I'm coming up with all these ideas. That's the creativity part. And then I'm asking, why must I use this? Because if, there's, if it's not a must, you're not going to do it because you have plenty of other things to do. Is that fair? Because there's a success formula, you capture on the left side of your page, head, heart, hands. You could think about things in your mind, set goals in your head and affirmations, KPIs, your objectives. But if you're not acting with your hands and you're procrastinating, raise your hand if you ever procrastinated before. <laughs> right? All, all of us. If there's a gap between your head and your hands, check in with the second H, which is your heart. Right? The emotion. We do things emotionally. We are emotional creatures. We're not logical. We're biological. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. We're this chemical soup. And so we want to be able to activate that. So head, heart, hands. Another way of putting it are our eyes. Information. That's good. Great. But sometimes you can listen to a podcast. There's a lot of information, but there's no inspiration to use it. Fair? But sometimes you can listen to a speaker or learn something and it's inspiring but you don't know what to do, right? Is that fair? So you have information, you have inspiration, and then you have implementation where you're doing it. And I feel like when you get all three eyes together, you have the most powerful eye, which is integration. That's my goal for all of you, is that when you read something, you listen to something, you, you, know, you learn something, it becomes part of who you are. It's integrated here, here, and here. And then you have an alignment, and what you, what, how it performs is it looks like magic to people. When, you know when somebody is aligned and they're in their element, it looks like it's effortless? You know, these flow states, it's powerful. It's three parts to it that I focus on. You know, when, how many of you have ever been in a zone where, and, and that's how it is when I'm reading. Like, people think that just because our program's called Quick Brain and Quick Learning and Quick Reading, it's frantic fast. It's not at all. It's just, it, it, there's a piece to it. It's like somebody who's fit and has strategies, if they have to climb a mountain, it looks like it's effortless because they've just done the work and they have strategy and they have tools to be able to do so. And somebody who maybe doesn't have those, those resourceful resources, it may, it's more effort, is that fair? So actually learning how to do these things, it's easier. Like when I read a book, I still read a book a day. It's just part of my practice. It's part of my mental hygiene. And I feel like it's the number one exercise because reading is to your mind like exercise is to your body. And some of you are already doing this, so I'm preaching to you, so I'm gonna show you how to do it better. But those of you who aren't on the other spectrum reading at all, the average person reads like two books a year. Now, if you're reading like more than that, that means somebody's reading a lot less, right, on the, on the other side. But it's the best exercise for your brain. People ask me all the time, how do I keep my brain young and how do I keep it energetic? And as I grow older, reading, reading. But the problem is a lot of people don't indulge in it because they're not good at it. And I wouldn't be 
playing a lot of golf if I was horrible at it all the time. But in psychology, they have something called the confidence competence loop. That the more competent you get at something, the more confident you get at it. And then the confidence will make you do it more, and you get more confidence, and then it cycles through in positive momentum, right? And you have examples of that in your own life. So, what I'm asking about here, the second part, is the inspiration is why must I use this? And you know what a question I ask a lot of is like, who's counting on me to, be, to win today? You know what I mean? First, because some of you, and I bring this up because some of you really will do more for other people than you will for yourself. So, knowing that about yourself, self awareness is a superpower, then tap into that. You don't have to change it, tap into it. Who's counting on me to like, be at my best? And then you'll, you're more likely to do it. And the reason I know this is because when I was driven so much, it was really my family who I wanted to make proud. Like, we all have our reasons, right? And one of my favorite books, I'm probably give you 12 of them you know, in this conversation, is Start With Why. It's a, it's a must read book by Simon Sinek. And you want to start with your why because reasons reap results. Reasons reap results. And even if remembering people's names, if you don't have a reason to remember their name, you don't. Like, how many of you have trouble remembering people's names? Raise your hand. See, all this is the thing you don't remember everyone's name, but you sure as heck don't forget everyone's name either, right? So, There's always genius leaves clues. You can write that down. Genius leaves clues. There's always a method behind the magic. And I bet you the names you remember are people that you have some kind of intention. You're attracted to that person. They could be good for your business, right? That something, there's some kind of motivation that's there. So find your motivation in your reading because if you're not motivated, you're not going to, you're not going to read very well. Is that fair? There, I did a podcast episode where I, in, how many of you listen to my, my podcast? Raise your, raise your hand. So I have a free podcast, no advertising. It's only 10, 15 minutes long. It's called Quick Brain, right? Just search my name on, on your podcast app. There's no, we don't promote anything on the podcast. My goal for you is I know what's inside of it and I know what's inside of you. And I want to help unlock that. And so we did a podcast episode on how to change your habits. And I interviewed a friend of mine, Dr. BJ Fogg. Now, BJ is head of influence and persuasion at Stanford University. One of his students co founded Instagram. You know, think about habits, right? And we talked about how to create a new habit, how to break old, disempowering habits. How many people would like to do that? Because you know, first you create your habits, and then your habits create you right back. So that's why your, the, the life of your dreams really is hidden in your daily routines, right? It's the things you do daily. And 40% of what you do every single day, and you think it's, it's all habitual. You're on autopilot. But when did those habits, when did you create those consciously and sit down those, and put together those routines? And so, two of the most popular episodes that, that I've done h a s to do with habits and then my morning routine. Like many of you know, I have 10 things I do every morning to jumpstart my brain. And those things are important because they're disciplined. And also, it reduces decision fatigue, which also takes away from the quality of your reading. A lot of you aren't reading because you're just exhausted. How many people feel that? And I bet you, though, it's not just because you're busy and doing too many things, it's because you're not doing enough of the things that make you feel alive. Is that fair? That you're bur- you feel burnt out, you feel tired and exhausted, not because you're so busy, it's just you're not doing enough of the things that, that nourish you, that fire you, that give you, that give you light, right? And I always, it's so important. One of my favorite books, another book, is Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And you know this because you have these books on your shelf, but have you, you, have you read it and utilized it and asked this question, how can I use this? And why must I use it? Because if there's no motivation, you're not going to get any of the benefits. But there's a habit in there that says, put first things first. Put first things first. And that's when you know you have a legendary life. You know, growing up, you know about my, my learning difficulties. What a lot of people don't know is my grandmother passed away of Alzheimer's. And how many of people have, had, have been affected by, look around. I mean, this is something that's growing dementia, Alzheimer's, brain aging challenges. And How many people know like, that person's not the same over time? Like, as a child, especially when I'd be called the wrong name or, or they would repeat themselves after just one minute or correct, these kind of things really affect you as a, as a child or, you know, and as an adult also as well. And so I spent a lot of time in senior centers, 
um, caregiving uh, centers, and not to teach them memory techniques, but really just have them share stories because there's so many lessons you can learn from everybody. You know, that's, my, that's a primary belief I have with accelerated learning is that everybody is your teacher. Everybody is your teacher. You know, and everything could be your teacher too. I just had Wim Hof back on our show, um, the Iceman, right? And you know, he, he was like, we were, like I was, well, it's awkward, I was in my bathtub with full of ice. And he was like, Jim, the cold is your teacher. You know, so everything could teach you something. And we know that the problems that we have in life are our teachers also as well. Like I have had, uh, you, know, seri- you know, we all have had serious issues in, in different areas of our life. You ask yourself, quite remember, questions are the answer. Where's the lesson in this, right? Your greatest, your greatest teacher is your last mistake, right? That's the power of going out there and making mistakes. And here's the thing, a lot of people won't be willing to make mistakes, including trying to learn something brand new, like a speed reading, because they're fear of messing up and not being perfect at something, right? And they don't, they don't feel, they feel that that can be successful. But you know in your life, whether you're, it's your career, whether it's your health or relationship or anything that, how do I put this? If, if failure is not an option, then neither is success. Is that fair? That if you're not willing to be able to step out, and what I said last yesterday uh, that the awards, was really that, that that's what we're here to be able to do, that the ultimate quest in life really is to reach our fullest potential, to express that potential, to be able to share that potential with others. And I know this because you're here, right? You're here because at some area, there's a gap between where you are and, and where you know deep down you could be. So why do you wanna be able to learn this? Why must you learn this? And the third question I ask when I'm reading something is when will I use this? So three questions, how can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? Three powerful questions that lead to something which I think the number one productivity performance tool there is, is your calendar. Because a lot of you say you wanna work out or you wanna meditate or you wanna do this self-care and you know self-love and self-care is not selfish and you know all this stuff, but, but how does your daily calendar reflect that? You know what I mean? Because I can look at anyone's calendar and see like where they are in life because of what they prioritize. First things first. I always tell people the key because you live backwards. Like even when, when I'm spending time in these senior centers, pulling off some memories and learning from them also as well, what, what I'm learning is so much. And at the same time, I hear a lot of regrets. And the number one regret I hear ongoing for two decades of doing this is that somehow they live their life for somebody else in some area of their life, right? And here's the thing, when we're, this is not a pleasant conversation, but this is what a coach who cares about, there's a difference between being nice and being kind. Do, do people feel that? Like they, these words are used interchangeably, like they mean the same thing. And this is a little pet peeve I have, and I'm not like really obsessive about like um, epistemology and words, but nice, anybody can be nice to you because they're not vested in you. Right? You could go to the grocery store and the, and the people working there and the people behind you, they'd be nice to you, but they, they, or people can be nice to you because they want something from you, but someone who's kind is different. Right? Nice won't go out of their way, but a kind person will. And a kind person will tell you the truth, not, not necessarily what you want to hear, because it's coming from a place of caring and compassion. And what I'm here, when I'm talking about this specifically, um, when it comes to your brain, is like, we're going to eventually you know, and this form of, you know, we're gonna transition at some point and many of us are gonna be in a coffin, we're gonna be in a box, and in that box, there's not a lot of room for possessions. Um, and you, if you have cars and everything, that's just wonderful, but there's certainly not a lot of room for regrets. And my challenge is, I remember I was coaching, doing a reading program for, for Jim Carrey, and we're in his, uh, in his kitchen making brain foods, and guacamole and everything, some of you know that, the genius foods I talk about, and I ask him, why do you do what you do? He was like, Jim, I act completely silly on camera because I want to give people who are watching permission just to be themselves. And that's the most important, to free people from concern. Because here's the thing, if you buy into the opinions of other people, you're going to go broke, right? If you're looking to be fueled by other people's expectations and opinions of yourself, then you're going to run out of gas. And you're like, what does this have to do with reading? And everything has, it comes back to this. Having the mental energy, or some people just don't read because of how it looks to other people, right? How many of you 
have people outside of this room that really don't understand why you're in this room. <laughs> Look around, like, why are you listening to another podcast? Why are you buying another book? Why are you doing this all the time? How many people have people like that? And here's the thing, like, the, sometimes the people that care about you the most are the ones that, that you give the power to hold you back. They don't hold you back, but you give them the power to do so. And I'm not saying it's easy when it's your spouse and your family. I'm not at all saying it's easy because sometimes learning like life is messy. But I'm here to say that the best thing you could do, because you can't change them. How many people realize you can't change an, another person, right? Think about how hard it is for you to change yourself <laughs> and much less change somebody else. And so that's very difficult. But the best thing you could do is be an example. Right? That if you're going through difficult times, difficult times, they can define you, they could diminish you, or they could develop you. But you decide. And it always comes back to decision. So prompting you to, with these three questions, how can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? And then it's in your calendar, and then it's going to happen. Just like that appointment at your doctor's appointment or a meeting with your investor, your top client, or whatever, and you gotta treat that time as the most important time, because if you can't do it for yourself, you're not gonna be able to do it for anybody else. Does that make sense? So when I'm taking notes, when I'm reading, I'm thinking those three questions. Otherwise, you'll just read a page, and you're like, okay, three, five pages, great. Nothing happens, nothing's different in the world because of that. All you did was invest time. And so you're no better off than somebody who's illiterate. Is that fair? Like, if you're not going to use what you're learning, you're no better off functionally in your life in terms of results than somebody who can't read at all. And so what I'm saying is, again, we have this full spectrum of people here. I know some of you already, we have a one book a week club, right? Hashtag one book a week. And for years, we give out books. People take a picture of their book, hashtag one book a week, tag me. Um, and we give out dozens of books every single week. And they're just sharing like, their big takeaway from, from their uh, from their book, you know, so there's accountable, so they're reading 52 books a year. I mean, that's a huge advantage as opposed to somebody who's reading two books a year. And the reason why I know this is because when I first learned these skills when I was 18 years old, I finally got to this place. And it's, it's interesting because one of my very, I started sharing this with other people because I got really upset that this wasn't taught back in school, this idea of, of meta-learning. And meta-learning really is the science of learning how to learn to unlock your super brain, learning how to concentrate, learning how to focus, learning how to be creative and to solve problems and to think, to be able to read faster, to be able to remember more. Because these, that's the most important skills right now, because if you could do all that, you know, marketing, Mandarin, martial arts, music, all that becomes easier. Because the seventh habit of highly effective people by Stephen Covey is what? Sharpen the saw, really good. Sharpen the saw, if you have all this wood you need to cut, and we have, metaphorical like to-dos and everything else, and, but you have a saw with a dull blade, it makes no sense to suffer and struggle and stress trying to do that if it's not sharp. And that's what people are doing with their reading. You're reading probably pages, like probably dozens and dozens of pages of books a day as it is, through texts, through blogs, through Instagram descriptions and everything. So you're reading, you just have to choose and be more selective what you're putting in here. And I think a lot of people need to really stand guard to the doors of, of your brain, if you will, because information is just everywhere. We're drowning information, right? But we're starving for practical wisdom and, 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 and inspiration. And that's why I think all these things come together. So the last question, again, is when will I use this? And you put it into a calendar and you employ it. Now, um, there are a number of things that keep you as a slow reader. One is lack of education. Right? So if you're, especially, how many of you have a family member or a child or someone on your team you'd like to be learning this right now too? You wish was here with you, right? So take notes for them. Learn with the intention of teaching. First obstacle to effective reading is lack of education. It's not a skill that we were taught, right? You're not born with the ability to read. And the last time you took a reading class, how old were you? Six. So has the, has the velocity, has the variety, has, has the demand increased a little bit since you were six? But we're still reading like we're a six-year-old. Does that make sense? And so you want to upgrade those kind of skills. Second obstacle to effective reading is lack of focus. Lack of focus. How many of you, when you read, your mind wanders and you can't concentrate? One of the reasons why is you're reading too slow. And this is a big rumor being spread around, I think, by slow readers. But if I, 
If I ask you to read faster, what do you think will happen to your re reading understanding comprehension? You feel like it'll go down. In actuality, it goes up. Like we have online program in 100, 180 country students, so we have a lot of data. Fastest readers tend to have the best comprehension because they have the best focus. Because your brain is a supercomputer, but when most people read, they feed this supercomputer one word at a time. Metaphorically, notice the feeling that you have, the sensation you feel when I talk slowly. You're like, you know, you're like, and then your mind, after over time, will start wandering, it'll be distracted, you start falling asleep, you start doing other things. Isn't that what you're doing already when you're reading? You're reading too slow. Just like when I talk too slow, your mind goes everywhere. That's the reason why. And so when you go faster, it's like driving a car faster. If you go driving slow, you know, you're drinking your tea, you're texting, doing your makeup, you're, you're, you're doing all these different things, five things, singing on song, all this stuff. But if you're racing a car, you're just doing one thing. You're just driving, right? And that's why when you read faster, you have better focus. And why, because you have better focus, you have better comprehension. The last reason I would say that we got to fix for your, for your reading speed is this thing called subvocalization. What, what's subvocalization, real quick? The inner talk. How many of you notice when you read something, you hear an inner voice, this voice inside your head, reading along with you? Hopefully it's your own voice, <laughs> not like somebody else's voice. The reason why it's a challenge is if you have to say all the words to understand them, you can only read as fast as you could speak. And you don't have to say New York City or Statue of Liberty or, you know, or even if it's an abbreviation, NYC. You don't have to say that in order to understand what it is any more than you would say like a stop sign. 95% of the words you've seen, you don't have to pronounce. That's why, how many of you listen to audiobooks and, and podcasts at higher speeds? Because you can understand it just fine, right? You just can't talk that fast. And so that's why it's a limitation when you're reading. Now, I did, I've done multiple podcasts on reading, and so that's why I want to direct you to it so that's where you can go deeper. Like, specifically, I did one on the difference between reading print and reading digital, because there is a fundamental difference. I don't know, how many of you prefer reading and physical print books over digital? How many of you prefer digital reading? Interesting, because digital, uh, digital is certainly um, you know, more convenient, especially when you're traveling and such like that. For me, I like print, you know, personally, much, much more. Um, also, when we're talking about audiobooks, there's a, I did a, pro, a session on the difference between reading and audiobooks, because there is a difference, all right? And I'm, I listen to audiobooks. It's great when you're working out, and it's great when you're driving and doing, you could do other things. But reading is much more active than listening to somebody talk, much like a conversation we're having right now. Is that fair? And so that's why it's such great, great exercise. In fact, I'm gonna take you through a quick exercise right now. I'm gonna show you something on the screen. Let's go to our, our main screen. I'm gonna show you a phrase in a moment, and I want you to read it out loud. That's the key. key. Everybody has to do it, otherwise we do it again. So you have to read it out loud if your partner's not saying it. But while you're doing it, I wanna train your focus, because focus is the key to reading. I want you to try to count the number of Fs as you're reading it out loud. Are you ready? How, how many people are ready? All right, out loud. Finish files of the result. How many Fs are there? How many people saw zero? Hold on, one, one F. Two Fs. Three Fs. Wow, most half the room, three Fs. Four Fs. Wow, four Fs, five Fs. A few five Fs, six Fs. Eight, seven Fs. One, two, two seven Fs. Eight Fs. So we see everything from two to seven Fs. Were we all looking at the same page? <laughs> Let's do it again. You have to read it out loud to get this. Ready? How many Fs are there? How many people say three? Raise your hand. Still half the room. Four, five, six, seven, a lot of seven, eight. All right, let's just do it one more time. And this time, <laughs> let's, I'm just really confused here. No, 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 wait, 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 shh. Don't even read it. Just look, just like look at it, whatever the remotely looks like an F. Don't even read it. Count, just count. How many of us are there? Six. 
There are six Fs. So, <laughs> where metaphorically, oh, it's actually not even metaphor. Where, where were the Fs if there, where were the Fs if you missed the first time? Ofs. And now here's how funny your mind is, because we have, it's, it's interesting, number one, we can all have the same thing in front of us and experience something different. I'm just putting that out there, right? But it's the same thing. The other thing is what made it difficult was saying it out loud, right? Finish file's result of, 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 what, what letter does it sound like? It sounds like a V. And your mind's like, oh, that's a V. And you just keep on going, right? And so what made it difficult was saying it, and my, my point to emphasize about subvocalization is not necessary to say the words to understand those words. And we did a whole episode on how to get rid or lower subvocalization. That's why we teach people to read three times faster, because it's not, it's not science, it's not like rocket science, it's just, hey, don't pronounce these words, because you were taught that in those circles. You had to read out loud, and then later your teacher was like, okay, read quietly to yourself. That's when you took that external voice, you put it where? internal, it's been there ever since. So th three things you could do, a couple things you could do to reduce subvocalization. Okay, then these are just really, now notice these are tips, right? Can you feel the difference between a tip and an actual condition training, like a quest, like where it takes 30 days? But the tip you could do, for example, is some people, they move their lips when they speak, and so that's what keeps them, re so you could interrupt that pattern. So some people will bite on their knuckles, which I don't think is very, very sanitary, or they'll chew gum while they do that. That will help. Some people listen to drown it out. They'll listen to music because that will drown out for some people who are, who get, who, who are set up a certain way will actually help to drown out the inner talk. Does that make sense? But a third thing you could do is counting, counting. Like, when you're reading, go one, two, three, four, five, six, and you're like, that's so crazy, that's so hard, right? But you can't talk to yourself while you count and still read, does that make sense? So you have to interrupt that pattern because it's been there since we were a child. And then you can move yourself into another bigger, bigger direction. Does that make sense? The last tip I will give you to leave you with is using a visual pacer, right? I want to remind you that when you read, that if you use your finger, a highlighter, a pen, a pencil, a mouse under, you know, with a computer, your eyes are attracted to motion. And even if you're not taught to use this as a kid, right, because you're given unique feedback like a ruler to not do that, you actually read better, not only faster, but better focus and comprehension because your eyes are attracted to motion. All right, and that's why the visual pacer helps you do that. Children automatically use their fingers all the time until we teach them not to. You use your finger. If I ask you to count the number of lines you just read, you'll all do this, one, two, three, four. You use a visual pacer naturally because your eyes are attracted to this, to this motion, if you will. All right? So we've done five episodes, free episodes online on the podcast, and you can listen to these. One on the basics of speed reading, use your finger while you read, asking questions, getting better comprehension. Remember we talked about the power of questions because it activates what we call your reticular activating system. But the main idea that I want to encourage everybody here is when you're reading, if you want to be a smart reader, a faster reader, you'll read better if you understand the information better. And what will get you there is reading for purpose. Ask yourself, how can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? And all of a sudden, everything from there, it just, it just opens up. The last thing is this, is just keep a reading list. Keep a list of like targeted books as you hear all the time. Keep it in your phone because I have like this, everybody has a to-do list, but I have like a to, I have a really long to-learn list. And this is my like to-read list. And that's the thing. One book could change your life forever. When I first taught this, one of those, my first students, she read 30 books in 30 days. I mean, can you imagine the books you would read? Not skimming or scanning or getting the gist of it. Not just, because that's what you can understand. Like, I don't want you to skip it and not understand it. Like, my clients are like, you know, uh, they're, they're financial advisors, they're attorneys, they're healers, they're, they're medical doctors. You don't want your doctor to get the gist of what she's reading, <laughs> right? So you want them to focus. So what I would say with this is, like, she read this, I want to find out not how. I know exactly how. Because the skills are simple, guys. I want to know why. And I found out her mother was dying of terminal cancer. And the book she was reading, the book to save her mom's life, because she was only given two, day, two months to live by doctors. And they're book, reading books that you read, books on wellness, 
energy medicine, alternative medicine, health, diet. And I was like, good luck, you know, I said prayers. Six months later, I get a call from this young lady and she's crying and crying, crying. Finally, when she stops, I find out their tears of joy that her mother not only survived, but is really starting to get better. Doctors don't know how, they don't know why, they called it a miracle. But her mother attributed 100% to the great advice she got from her daughter who learned it from all these books. And I realized at that moment, And I realized at that moment that me as a broken child who couldn't read for years and years, I realized that would be my mission. That knowledge, if knowledge is power, then learning and especially reading is your superpower. And now is the time to unleash it. Thank you very much. Thank you.